about in a family situation, and we understood um, why that was put there. We were going to get to the middle <coughs> later uh, and deal with them within the scriptures, but all of us have to submit to someone. Um, that's how a society runs through submission. Um, we also went and we started to look at clothes. It was talking about the wife, how she um, uh, carried herself, how her hair was. And we got to that verse 3, that verse 3. Someone go ahead and read that verse 3, please. Not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, and wearing the gold, and fine apparel. We went through a lot of the scripture already, and uh, we looked at it during Peter's time. Remember, his time was during Nero. Uh, the church was under a lot of persecution. Uh, the people, the Christians, they had to make a decision. Uh, are we going to be separated? Are we going to be different? Are we going to look different than the other Gentiles, the heathens in the world? So a decision had to be made within their lives, and they needed that to be defined. And I think that we're in a day and time that we need some things defined. Now, as we look at and talk about clothing, we start to get into it, and we got into details. Now, as we go into the details tonight, uh, we're not going to give you uh, any specifics that you have to wear or anything like that, because that's legalism. But God has to speak to your heart as you're a Christian. There should be some difference in the way we carry ourselves than those who are in the mainstream and the world. And we're going to look at those things. Uh, a lot of questions came up uh, during our Bible study on last time. Uh, we talked about trends. Someone talked about how people used to dress uh, in the yesteryears and how does that compare. Um, hopefully we'll be able to look at that tonight. We're going to go through a, a lot of studies on that. And then I gave you homework. If you remember the homework, um, we talked about what is good clothing or bad clothing in your opinion. Now as we, we do this, hopefully you've been, I gave you a little liberty uh, to look around at people and to observe clothing, uh, things that you may say is good or bad. Now, now if you're on the bad side tonight, I don't want you mad. Don't be leaving the church when everybody, <laughs> people been looking at me how I'm Chris. These are our opinions, okay? And we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, we've got different generations, different stages, all types of things that we've got to deal with. But we still have to come to a consensus of what modesty is. And we're going to get down within um, our study that we've been dealing with. So those who did their homework and not afraid to speak of um, good clothing, one, one piece that you think is good. Anybody? Y'all ain't do your homework, did you? Yes, yes, ma'am. A blouse. Okay, a blouse. Uh, we want to write these things down so that uh, we can keep it in our minds and compare. So she said, you just need a blouse on. That's <laughs> one piece that's, that's very essential uh, to, to good clothing. Yes, ma'am. All right, um, pleasing to your uh, proper, how do we say that, proper proportion? All right, not bad your, uh, all right, too tight, okay. All right, the blouse, so we got a blouse, we're going to wear a blouse, that's cool, and, and it can't be too tight, and it can't be too bad. We all good, that's good. What's bad? Okay, yes ma'am? Short dress. What's this, short dress? Oh, all right, short dress. There you go. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't go too quick, man. Um, spandex. All right, we'll, we'll deal with those. <laughs> okay, all right. Steve is upset with that you wear 12, but you buy a size 6. So, um, a bad, too tight clothing. Or clothing that's too tight. All right. There was some other hands. Yes, sir. Baggy pants. Baggy pants. Baggy pants. Okay. Baggy All right. Saggy pants. Yeah. Saggy pants. Okay. All right. Um, this is either said um, low cut pants. You mean the kind of come? Okay. All right. All right. Low cut, low cut pants. Yes, ma'am. Daisy Dukes. <laughs> Child shall leave them. Bad Daisy Dukes. All right, what's some good things? Yes, ma'am.
and you're not fighting. Okay, I, that's, I think that's kind of with spandex. That line. Yes, sir. You know how uh, uh, guys wear these uh, jogging pants? Okay. And sometimes they're so loose fitting, some guys don't even wear underwear under them. And you follow me? They, it's, uh, it don't look good. Okay. Okay. Alright, so loose fitting jogging pants. Again, we we'll go back to the underwear thing. Uh, yes. I guess the uh, clothing that has alluring uh, elements to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something that they can say 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 that they can Good or bad? bad. Okay. Um, bad pajamas. All right. Pajamas as uh, a regular dress of the day. All right. Let's good. We're about out of space for our bad. Um, go back to our good side, please. This is all good. All right. Some good stuff. Yes, ma'am. Sweatpants. All right. Kenzie says sweatpants. Good thing. Anything else? Good thing. Yes. Um, not, not a specific item, but I think it should desire that our outside represent what's on the inside. All right. Um, representing our inside by how we dress on the outside. So a picture. When you see someone, you should be able to kind of picture what they're their inside, their spirit man looks like. Okay. Sweaters. Sweaters are good. All right. Sweaters. If they're not too tight. All right. So we got sweaters. <laughs> Tabitha, if you put it, pull it all down, please. Some more good things. Yes, ma'am. All right. A, a dress, a good dress suit. A dress suit for uh, good uh, for women also with that. All right. Uh, Sister Edith said pantsuit. Come on, Tabitha, speed up. Uh, pantsuits. All right, yes, sir. Belts. Belts. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? That, that's one of my pet peeves. People not wearing belts, or my kids not wearing belts when you got loose because it doesn't keep up your pants. So belts. All right, any others? Yes, ma'am. Socks and stockings. Okay, socks and stockings. Ah. Socks and stockings. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. All right. I, we'll have to deal with this. Appropriate hair color. Okay. And, and, uh, these are opinions because we have to go to the point what is appropriate and all these other things. But appropriate hair color uh, for uh, good things, please. Yes. Okay. Um, Sister Edith brings to a point appropriate dress for occasion. All right, appropriate dress for occasion. Tab, if you slide it all down so we can see it all, and we'll go back over to it. As we look at these signs, there's something that we can learn. We all have different opinions. Now, I want you to compare it um, as um, we, we look at this, and Tab, if you pull this back down so we can see that whole part there. We've got all of these different good and bad sides. We've got our blouses, how they should dress, how they should fit. What are some things that we can say everybody should have? What can we agree on? Because some of y'all disagree with what's bad. Y'all just didn't say anything. Some, some of y'all looked at the good side and said, longer dresses, that's, that's bad. I ain't wearing no long dress. OK, since Eve is not through this good bad thing, what, too much jewelry? All right, too much jewelry on the bad side. So all of these things, the, the words that we, we keep talking about is appropriate, okay, appropriate. What can we learn? What can we learn from the list? We kind of just all over the church, both sides of the church. What are we getting out of this? All right. 
we're looking for where we can kind of come. We need to have clothes on. Can everybody agree with that? Amen. Amen. Young people, old people. All right. As Christians, we need to have clothes on. Okay. Yes, ma'am. But you have to look at you have all different shapes and sizes of people. You have to just wear the appropriate size for your for your body. All right. The appropriate size for your body. Everybody agree with that? All right. Does, does, does everybody be on the same page? Appropriate size for your body. Therefore, we're going to have to, and style Sister Edith brought forth, um, therefore, we're going to have to make sure that we don't follow somebody else that has a different body type. Right? And, and I think that's become a problem. Um, I, I've seen this over and over again. Something that looks good on your six-year-old may not look good on your 50-year-old. <laughs> Amen. And we all seen it. We all seen it. It's cute. It's real cute on a six-year-old. But when that fifty-year-old wear it, like, what was she thinking? So this whole process of body type is important. Yes, sir. And, you know, what you were just at, what you just said, sometimes that requires communication. Okay. Because some people are not able to determine that. Really. So some people, some people put on the tights and they really. I think it looks good. All right. They need some help with someone telling them this is not appropriate. I mean, they, they maybe they remember back when they used to do it and whatnot, whatnot. But, but sometimes the appropriate needs communication from somebody else to help the person understand that that's not appropriate. All right. And that's, that's, that gets into it. So communicating on what appropriate is. Us just talking about it. I think some of you are like, oh, man, I, I maybe didn't think about that so much or that was a concern. I think that's what we're missing out in the church, too, or in the Christian community. Nobody wants to speak up. I believe that there are genuine people that are addressed and thinking that that's appropriate. I think some of them really think they just don't know that that's not appropriate because they've been dressing like that for such a long time. And maybe if someone was more gentler, I could come to them in a, a Christian way, in a loving way, and say, you know, maybe not, and give explanation. Why is it? A lot of times we tell people don't. But why? Why shouldn't they do that? And then maybe we can grow and work in that. Yes, there was a hand. Yes, ma'am. Uh, All right. The appropriate clothing. We can agree with that. Having appropriate clothing for a season. A lot of times in the winter time, you see people with little or nothing on, and it's cold outside, and and all of these things. So that could be inappropriate. There was other hand. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. So as we're looking as Christians, we're growing in our understanding of, of dress. Maybe some people that we're looking at don't have anything else to dress, to wear. Uh, and we dealt with that on last time. Um, you know, where do we buy clothing like this from? We're going to talk about that a little later. Yes, sir. The reason why there's a lot of times Okay. All right. We have tattoos in some places, and so we get the clothes to the tattoos. All right. <laughs> um, as we're looking at this list, Dick Rudd says sometimes our clothing is because we want to show off certain parts. And as Christians, we've got to decide what we should be showing off. All right. Good point. Uh, there is other hands. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Let 
too tight. And so some, you're right, some people have decided to be taught what to wear, what not to wear. Um, but there's always a way to, to approach somebody that, that we feel is dressed and appropriate. All right. A good understanding. There was a couple more hands. Yes, sir. Uh, and also, color, color coordination. All right. You know, uh, I think you should have that color coordination. Okay. You know, uh, that, that makes a man look like a man and makes a man feel like a man. It does me. If, if I got a bad attitude, you know, I feel bad because I got a bad attitude, I could put on something to brighten that attitude up. You know what I'm saying? I might not, I might not come to check with a good, hey, how you doing? But I'd be looking good. <laughs> All right. So representing, maybe even how we dress can change maybe even our attitude, that whole process. Did he get all the hands? Yes, sir. You know, fast out the game, I want everybody to look top of everything that's going on and everything. I come up to this and I, I don't take the excuse that you don't know what you're wearing. I'm sorry. I don't take the excuse the good thing. Well, the good thing's okay, but the bad thing, yeah, they're bad too. People know about. People know what to do. Because we worship a man by the name of Jesus Christ. And he in his in the in the Bible telling us what we need to do. He doesn't tell you that you need to be the spandex and Matthew. It's those spandex and Matthew. But you if you're a believer and you come into his house on a Sunday morning, you gotta get it correct. You see what I'm saying? So you know, all these excuses, but they all, you know, just watch this Sunday coming up, okay? There'll be somebody that didn't get the news. <laughs> but they don't, they, that's because, like my wife said, they might not know the Lord. But you should know about the Lord's house. God, you don't come in there incorrect. You got to come there correct. Now, if you fail to do that, that's on you. And, and, we, and that's an opinion. He has an opinion. He said that, that there is no excuse that we do know as Christians, all right? Some say we don't, he's saying there is, and that's an opinion. You need to know that's how some are thinking and are very strong in their attitudes towards that. And you gotta deal, you gotta deal with the Serranos of the world. They have a strong attitude on how you carry yourself. And notice he said on Sunday, but if it's me, every day, it's not just Sunday. I think, I think sometimes our standards for Sunday have skewed our whole week. We like, oh, if I dress real nice on Sunday, I can dress like a pole dancer during out the week and it's okay. You know, I still love Jesus. All those things. So I think we need to expand that. Not just on Sunday. We're not, this is not just a Sunday thing. Alright? Because I don't see in scripture where you have to dress a certain way on Sunday. Challenge me. So you can search it out. I don't see it. I, I just don't see it in scripture. So I can't deal with just the Sunday thing. I have to deal with a whole thing, but we've got those thought patterns. There were two more. Yes, ma'am. I agree that um, as Christians we should know and we should practice what we know is right. But one thing I've observed um, on Sunday mornings, occasionally, people that may come in a little late and they have to be seated on the front row and they may not be dressed appropriately, and the usher may bring in one of those little cloths or whatever, and they don't have a clue what to do with it. And they just put it, you know, on the street beside them. Not knowing that you know, maybe there's something that you need to cover up. So there are people who I think don't know. Okay, all right, don't have, those are our privacy cloths. If you sit on the front, everybody gets one. Uh, especially when I sick your urshers, uh, if you're a female, you get one. We're not saying your skirt too low or whatever. Everybody gets one um, for that. It used to be in churches. I grew up in churches that actually had a privacy wall. Y'all remember those? That's what it was. The elders realized something. Okay, when you sit down, sometimes those dresses slide back. So we're going to put a wall in front of it. And actually, Ebenezer used to have. We moved that out so it could be more open. Uh, and the choir stand especially would be a privacy wall because they're sitting up higher. And it's really high, uh, hard uh, to hide your legs and all of that if something's not there. So even in choirs, you may have to wear a longer dress or whatever, a robe, so you can keep your privacy because you're so high up. Very important. Uh, yes, Steve. Alright, so as Christians we need to have a heart that wants to grow, that desires to be corrected. 
the desires to talk things out. Now, I mean, you could be totally right, but if someone comes to you and they're offended by your dress, talk it out. Don't, don't just discount it, because there, maybe there is something that you can change, which is important. As we get into it, I'll get you, uh, Deacon Kelly, I, I want to go down a little bit more on this excursion on uh, Christian dress, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, a majority of this lesson tonight is going to be talking on dress. But as we get to that first paragraph, someone read that, please. Another is modesty. Paul says with propriety and moderation. One meaning of the word propriety is decent. One of the functions of clothing is to hide man's nakedness. At least that's the way it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we're dealing with this, this whole thing of modesty. First of all, how did man start off? Naked. 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 And then, what happened? Sin. Sin. All right? Sin. And then what happened? Fig leaves. Yeah. All right? Covered in it. And we're supposed to be covered ever since. Amen. Except, what is one rule um, that we're not uncovered within Scripture? Yes, I heard it. What? Somebody said it back there. Well, when you're born, but scripturally talking about being uncovered. Marriage. It talks about being naked, naked before your husband and wife and not being ashamed. That's the one thing within scripture that we actually see that. So we know from scriptures we need to cover ourselves. Our body needs to be covered. But the question is, how do we do that? D. Kelly, you had your, your hand up. Yeah, I think we moved on, but I was just going to say, you know, sometimes it's Christmas, you know, we invite people. I, I've invited people. Shorter, she would she would have been considered a little risque 
Uh, that's the shortest the dress would have been at that time. Okay, and that was with the 1920s. All right, so let's progress. Beyond the, the, the cloche or the flapper, clothing styles consists of more than just the cloche. Is that how you say that, ladies? I don't know. All right, we'll, we'll go with it. And flapper. In fact, this is the era during which more casual clothing was introduced to the public. For example, women began to wear pants more often, and there were certain styles of women's shoes that were unique to this decade as well. So 1920s, something changed. Before then, all women pretty much wore dresses. If you had a dress on, you were a what? That's just 1920s, that's just the way it was. But into the 1920s, it started changing. Some women's like, you know what, forget this. I want to wear pants. So at that point, when they wore pants, what do you think the 1920 ladies that were wearing dresses said to the pants ladies? You're out of order. That's not appropriate. Can you imagine 1920 ladies, you know, the uh, 1918 to 20 ladies coming to church in their nice dresses, and all of a sudden a lady had pants came in? You think she would have been put out? So this, that's, and we've got to deal with this, this appropriateness, because some people think that literally wearing pants for a woman, that's inappropriate. Okay? Um, going up a little bit, you can see the uh, different uh, styles at that point. Uh, both men and boys often wore short knee pants, knickers, along with sweaters, or casual shirts. Moreover, the shoes that boys wore usually made of canvas. I thought that was interesting, all right? So we're progressing. So we're still covered. We still got a little dissension on what appropriate is or not. Pants have been introduced to women, but everybody's good. Everybody's good with the dress, right? All right, 1920s. Let's move up a little bit. Children's clothing. One other change that was significant of the 1920s is the fact that baby clothing were designed to be more what? Practical. Look at this. More comfortable outfits such as rompers and short dresses replaced the frilly lace dresses and other formal baby attire. For older girls, dress was different as well. They usually were seen wearing items such as cotton frocks, cardigan sweaters, and canvas shoes or sandals. Now I want you to walk with us because there's a subtle change that's beginning to take place. I left this here. Uh, there, it says men clothing suits pre-war were $30. All right, that was 1920, New York, 1920. Um, silk line suit, $50. The prices have definitely changed. Go on up, please. Now we're going to go to the fashions of the 1950s. All right, so we got the 1920s in our mind. All we see the biggest change was pants. Look at this. Someone read that if you can hear. It. Give me a little break. During the war, so can y'all see that? Whoever wants to read. <laughs> All right. As we stop there, something happened. As we go to the 1950s, we've got war. Now, rationing things and all that sort. So, 1940s, greatly influenced by rationing limited, limited quantities of fabric. So, what you wear now is not because you can just go out and buy it, but literally, there's not a lot of fabric. Right. All right, that is determining how people even dress at that point. Go ahead, once World War II. Once World War II and rationing. Right there. What happened in your words? 
from 1920 to 1950, what occurred? War happened. After the war, what happened? Excess. We started to get more stuff. All right, I want you to think, because I want, I want you to examine why do we dress the way we dress? Who taught us, okay? So we were driven for just practical purposes of covering our body. Then we didn't have much because of the war. Then we started to have a whole bunch. Now something comes in, it's called what? Started with a C. Consumerism. All right, now our country, it wasn't, it really wasn't driven by consumerism before this time. But now the Industrial Revolution, all these things, starting after war process, now we're driven by, you got to buy my product. This is what's going to drive our society, all right? So we want to get the attention of people, this consumerism. Look at this. Style clothing became an important part of culture in the 1950s with the country going through many societal and cultural changes. So in the 1950s, our society is changing. Our thought patterns is changing. What we consider right and what we consider wrong is being changed by a bigger entity. I put before you that the devil is smarter than we think he is. You can believe it or not, all right? You can believe it or not. God has already put in his scriptures. It has not changed. But I believe there's a bigger thing that's attacking Christians than we realize. Now, now if you're not saved, you dress the way you want to dress, right? You know, you do your thing, right? And we're going to have to deal with as you do your thing as Christians. But as Christians, we got to examine where are we learning the way we carry ourselves? Who is speaking into our minds? Look at this. It says, it would showcase one place in society more so than ever before and became a way to express conformity and what? Our dress said in 1950s and even now, if I dress this way, I can conform, or if I dress this other way, I'm individual. I express who I am by my dress. All right? This had already started in the 1950s. Look at this. Women's role in fashion. This shocked me. Really, I, I never thought about it. I never thought about how this all started. I, you know, you just kind of think I just put on clothes, cover myself, and they're color coordinated and all these things. Because of the end of the World War II and the economic boom, men were sent back to the war in record numbers. Make sense? They were uh, came back to work. I'm sorry, in record numbers. This meant that two of the primary driving forces behind the consumerism of the 1950s were housewives and the baby boom. Right? Baby boomers. So, ladies, maybe the scriptures are right. They are right. As we're talking about clothing, the ladies were the driving thought in even how we see clothing at this time. The men were working. They just put their clothes on. Now, we know men have style and things of that sort, but that's not the way it started. The ladies, all the consumerism was focused on the ladies of that time. In nearly all the department store catalogs used to compile this section of fashion of the 1950s marketing was geared towards who? Women. 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 There were no, I, I did the studies, there were no catalogs for men per se. It was women during that time. Commercialism was focused on them. Descriptions of clothing included subtle cues that certain clothing and fashionable looks would help what? <laughs> These were subtle clues in the 1950s. If you dress like this, you're going to please your husband or you can find a husband. Already our clothing is becoming to a point of defining our personality. Very important to know. Yes, sir. You know, Pastor, I've been to Europe and all those places. I've noticed that in France, that's the way couture, they call it, but the culture of the dress, that it's still on top of women. Women still are the ones that get those weird-looking dresses and hats, look like they're going to fly off their heads and stuff. But it's just women. Now, if you go to England and you go to uh, Italy, Giorgio Armani, Gucci, all those guys, they basically, they do men's suits, but they still up top with women. 
but they, they, you, you get a $3,000, $4,000 people and something like that, right? And a $50,000, 50, uh, $500 check. But still, they, they're hot on the women. Japan, too. So we see those trendings that are still there. Look at this as we kind of speed up. Even the descriptions of men's clothing indicated that women would most likely be choosing and purchasing the clothing of their husbands or for their husbands. There was also a certain way that women were what? Who told you? Ladies, men, who told you? Who told you what you have on tonight look like? Where did you where did you get that thought pattern? And then if, if you can pinpoint somebody who told you, who told them? Yeah. Who told them? And that's the whole because their expectations that are already set up. Fashion started to emphasize conformity. That's what we're talking about. Women were sold on a certain what? Body shape. See the change? Yep. 1930s, it was just dress. Started to go. It was just fabric. Now is you got to look a certain way, certain body shape that would best fit the latest fashions, and that shape was a thin waist with defined hips and a larger but very defined and shapely bust. So now fashion, whoever's in charge of that, said, okay, instead of somebody going out and dressing something that complements how they look. We want them to change the way they look to fit our fashion. Are you with me? Did I say that right? This is 1950s. It changed. You just flipped. Those, because now we're buying more. So now they can say, hey, if you want our clothes, because that's what you want, you got to fit in our clothes, so we're going to help you fit in our clothes. We're going to sell you more stuff to give you the shape so you can look like our clothes. Now, who told us how we dress? Um, um, compared to today's standards, that feature extremely thin and very tall models, that image might seem more attainable and more natural for most women, but it still placed a lot of pressure on women and girls during the decade to conform to an idealized beauty standard. Some of y'all may remember this. Corsets. Lady, anybody explain what a corset is? It's a girl, all right? So if you had too much stuff in here, this corset would actually, you could pull that thing tight and it would pull it in. All right, so the tighter you got, that meant your waist got smaller so you could get in the fashions of the day. All right, and literally some, some people died from that because their intestines were drawn. All kinds of bad stuff happened, but all because that's what society said we had to dress that. That's the way we had to look. So we went from you know, putting on stuff that felt good, we looked okay in, to now I'm, I'm pain, I'm in pain, but I look real good. <laughs> they ought to be saying, hey, man, how? All right, courses, controllers, and bustier top for standard beauty fare and latex and nylon slimmers mirror heavily marked towards, or heavily marked uh, towards women. Bras and bus padding, a man in the house, that helped achieve that defined and almost cone like shape for bus were also in abundance. Because consumerism, now, hey, man, they'll buy our clothes. So if we can get them to buy the other stuff too, we make more money. We can actually shape the people and, and they fall right into it. We can make them to look the way we want them to look. But we got to give them accessories. Because if you don't have all of that, you got to buy the special bras, amen, to get that shape. So they sell all of these things to us. Um, the choice and variety of clothing made in stout sizes for older women also started to fade into the what? We, 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 don't, we don't believe in big women anymore. So we, we're going to make them... You know, they need 12, but all we're going to do is sell six. Amen? You, you see that, that whole process. These different styles are meant to impress and please others, including husbands, neighbors, friends, and employers, with much less emphasis on whether these fashions express the individual identity of the women who wore them. 
All right, so this whole process, this conformity of style coming in. Sister Kelly, could you read that during the 1950s? During the 1950s, style was used to say common standard of look. This meant that not many choices appeared masculine or feminine. Women were not allowed to wear dresses or All right, so these fashions of 1950, someone put in your own words, what's happening now? Now we all gonna look alike. Now we all gonna look alike. So in 1950s, if you had it going on, you had matching outfits for your whole family. So when y'all went out, little baby was matched with the colors. Everybody had the same colors. You know, the pedophiles, when they went out, <laughs> they were together. All right, you know, whatever the courses and everything, but they were together, all right? And we can see these matching styles. Everybody wanted to look like, or their families look alike with these different families. I want to point out, look at the waist size. Right? That, this is unnatural. Some of you ladies are like, no, come on. It, it, it wasn't. It was because of the course that they were pulling themselves so they could have those small, small waist size. For men, fashion changed very little throughout the decade. I saw this, I did all the studies. They did you know, pants, shirt, whatever they did going to work. Choices were suits, sports, coats, slacks, sweaters, or casual wear, all in similar fabrics and styles. Occasionally, bolder patterns might emerge for casual wear, but business clothing remained largely unchanged during the 50s. Basically, and if you look at that clothing style now, pretty much the same for men. The rise of the teenage culture. I right, really want you to listen to this. Remember, we hadn't talked about teens. All we talked about is women, commercialism, men wasn't really involved in it. All of these fashions have been focused on toward the women. The teens came around the middle of the decade. A separation between child and adult styles began, and the gap was filled by teenage clothes. They said, you see the progression? We can sell another line. There's another market. Amen. Look at your phones. How, why do we got so many different phones in the house? Because there's another market. We can sell them something else because it's driven on consumerism. So now we've got to come up with something else that maybe is a little bit different so people will want because we always want. Right? We always want. That is a part. Uh, whether you save or not save, you've got to deal with that. We want stuff. That is a part of us. But our want is never satisfied. Anybody know that? You, you get something, you go, that's all I want. Then until tomorrow, <laughs> you want something else. Look at this. Resulting from economic boom and uh, baby boom uh, coinciding teenage style culture and consumerism became a major part of society for the first time in recent history. Teens started to get what? Teens actually started to get money during the 1950s. A disposable income because what's happened in the United States, we're becoming more profitable. More money is flowing, so we got to do something with it. We don't really want to save it per se, we want to do what? Spend it. Spend it. And what does commercialism and consumerism say? We got to give you something to spend it on. <laughs> Teens started with this disposable income, Parents, part-time job, they also started to gain more leisure time, and that combination meant more shopping. Before all this time, leisure time wasn't really there. It wasn't. People didn't have time to play on PS3s and all that. It was stuff to be done. But as we become so much more blessed, we got so much more money, now we have more time, and now we have more time to and leisure. This whole process, this, this amazing plan. Um, look at around 1955, we started to see that some of the biggest trends are targeted towards teenagers. Suddenly, whole department and catalog sections are devoted to mainly female teenagers and young adults. At this point, teenage culture and clothing also became a large part of what? Are you, are you walking with me? 
right? Clothing, all is a part of this. So whoever's controlling this goes, man, we can make more money. Now television is a part of this. How can we connect the people's minds with what they see and what's being worn? We can teach them how to dress. We're very simple people, aren't we? The beginnings of the change. Just Kelly, if you read that, please. 1950. Y'all remember that? All right, so now you got a rebellion style that's coming up. Uh, the Fonzie type. Remember that? <coughs> Leather, all that. A fashion from the 50s greatly showcased the mood of the decade and emphasized consumerism and conformity. Going into the 1960s, fashion started to reflect the upcoming diversity and individuality that would become the main focus behind the fashion revolution during the next decade. All right, as we go into this next decade quickly, notice this. 1960. Anybody remember 1960s? Less people needed to or even wanted to make their own clothes, and the emergence of even more commercial fashion opportunities meant that using clothing as a status symbol was no longer confined to the what? Now nobody really. We got enough money. Who wants to make their own clothes? So now a market emerges. We'll make your clothes for you. Right? But if we make the clothes for you, we want what you desire, but we're going to put our flair and our thoughts past it. Fashion could now be used to distinguish between levels within the middle class and even within the poorest class in the United States. So now my dress style could distinguish how much money I made. Right? Because of different fashions. Uh, you remember those? Different styles. <laughs> Um, along with more modern look, people took fashion cues from the prominent figures in politics. Jackie Kennedy and the peel box hat to entertainment shared with long black hair and bell box. What was acceptable in terms of personal fashion changed quickly and often. We can see that now, right? It changes because they're telling us different things. Hem lines of skirt rose higher for women, hair length grew longer on men, and two-piece bikinis became common swimming attire. You know, it was a time that two-piece bikinis were not even, nobody even thought about that? Somebody told us. Look at this. Uh, if fashion of the 1950s first inspired individuality or individual identity through style, the 60s fully embraced and encouraged. So a whole change in process is occurring here. Just, just summing this up, fashion influence of music and television, although it was invented much earlier, television ruled in the 1960s. As technological advances made manufacturers easier and cheaper, and as the middle class and disposable income grew, there was a sharp rise in the number of households that owned, uh, what? Wow. Yeah, we just blessed, right? Somebody, who told you? Who told you? Where did you get that from? So television comes in. Great. Technological advance. Man, I'm, we, we love. We use those things. But there's something that occurred. This had a major influence on what people were exposed to, including fashion trends. Whatever you're exposed to and see, oftentimes you follow that. As they could see what was going on in the fashion world through their favorite television personalities and by seeing their favorite musicians perform on televisions, not only did TV shows influence the popular fashion trends at the time, but television commercials and an increased effort on marketing towards youth added to the importance of staying in style and cultivating an individual fashion sense. Right? So all these process getting in our mind, who told us? Go ahead to the next one, please. Different styles, the cone hats. I saw somebody with that the other day. Yeah. <laughs> Music became important to the fashion of the 1960s too. Many of the most popular genres were associated with specific fashion trends that emerged at the time. So now, people are dressed in certain ways because their favorite music artists dress that way. Sound familiar? Yep. Who told us? 
Hippie in fashion. I didn't want to lay this out because some of y'all are still hippies at this time. At the opposite end of the consumer fashion spectrum from the mods were the hippie and their unique style. The hippie counterculture emerged from the West uh, Coast culture of the United States and spread throughout the country from the mid 60s on. So now you had a, a counterculture that says, you know what, we don't like what they're wearing, but we want to come up with our own style. Hippie fashion represented a rebellion against consumerism. And the clothes and accessories were often handmade or purchased from where? Flea markets. They actually started to see, hey, they're controlling the way we're dressed. We don't want to do this, so we're going to rebel. But they kind of went to the other end of it. The style featured long maxi skirts, bell bottom jeans, flowing fabric tops, peasant blouses, paisley, floral, bright tie dyes, and Eastern Indian, Native American, and African motifs. Sandals were the footwear of choice for men and women, and long hair was encouraged. The conventional rules for presenting oneself were wholly shunned, and men sported long, unkempt beards with their long hair. Y'all know anybody like that? Yeah, y'all remember that when y'all used to have hair. Hippie women rejected makeup and revolted against the restricting shape wearing garments like girdles, padded bras, nylons, and controllers that had been considered the norm for the previous decade. See how it changed? So we have a counterculture saying we don't want to wear any of that. We just want to be free. We want to be loose. Those were the hippies. Y'all ain't real quiet because that was some of y'all. Yeah, yeah. High fashion of the 60s. And I'm going to stop right here. And our next time, we're going to bring it back. Still talking about mod modesty. High fashion in the 60s was nothing without the iconic models that showed off new styles and inspired some designers and artists as well. In the opinion of some, many of the first models to be considered supermodels came out of this decade, and many others still reach levels internationally acclaimed. As we look at our lesson tonight, I want you to start really thinking, why do I have these clothes on? Where am I getting my style from? I want you to really study this week. I want you to look at, we got more information going to deal with modesty. And I want to challenge yourself, who are you going to follow? Where is your style going to come from? So if you come to the point and you say, you know what, um, I'm getting my style from whatever. Where do we get our style from? That's your homework. What are our alternatives? Where do I learn a style that's pleasing to God? All right? Where do I learn a style that's pleasing to God? So I want you to look at it. Why do I dress the way I dress? And how can I be more like Christ? Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, wouldn't a lot of that have to do with the type of person you are inside? You know, if I'm going to dress the same way, my style, even though I see a lot of styles out here, I make like shoes on this guy, maybe the shirt and tie on this guy, and the suit on this guy, but all this is coming to my head and making me you follow what I'm saying? It's like bowling me. I'm seeing myself in all these different things. I'm seeing my myself. Okay. I'm seeing how I will look in that particular outfit. And, and Brother Pepper, that's what I want to deal with you. The problem is when somebody else is controlling the fashion, they give you A through D. Mm -hmm. You can choose between A through D, but it, they still have made the choice for you. You can mix A and D all up, all you want, but that's all you see. What if God wants us to dress F through Z? But all we see, because we've been told, is A through D. And so we're defining ourselves by A through D that the world told us, but there is a whole bunch of other that we don't even consider because we haven't asked ourselves, why am I putting this stuff on? Don't get me excited. I want you to examine that because I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad because I believe Christians, we've been hoodwinked, and we've got to get back in the script and say, God, speak to me. I want to glorify you in whatever state that is. Amen? Amen. Out of time. Amen. Come to our feet. Yes, sir. Pastor, you don't have to worry about that. Because you get an What's the garment you're going to get at eight? Heaven. <laughs> Come on to your feet. You're clothed in heaven, too. I just want to let you know that.